So tonight, as we uh, get going into this service, um, it's a fairly short service. Uh, the sermon is fairly short. Um, it is entitled Cheap Grace. Uh, this is the sermon that I had kicked around for a long time. Uh, I thought that I'd go uh, a lot longer with it, but you guys are lucky. It's only a two-pager, not a five-pager. Um, and I went back and forward between would this be my Easter Sunday sermon or would it be Good Friday? And I really felt, um, you know, I wanted to do it on Easter Sunday so more people would hear it. But then I got to thinking, no, it needs to be heard on Good Friday. Uh, so as I pondered back and forward, I settled on today. And uh, this actually came um, from, once again, every now and then there's something good off of Facebook. It was a uh, another pastor of mine, Ron Pegram, who is going through pancreatic cancer. Uh, who had the post on there talking about cheap grace. And so I've, I've been pondering this for quite a while. But uh, before we get into it, uh, we're going to read the crucifixion story. Uh, I have chose the uh, Luke version uh, this year, and I'm going to be reading out of Luke uh, 23, um, verses 32 through, um, I believe I said, 40. Seven. Thank you. And if you want, if you want to use the Pew Bibles, it's page 908. And this is the NIV version. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right in the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up to him and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar, and he said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him and said, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now when you preach a Good Friday sermon, you know this, the scripture is more or less going to be about the same. And there are so many different angles and avenues that you could take this sermon. So many different things that you can learn from what is going on. But today, I'm going to start with asking you some questions. If you want to say them out loud, you can, but I'd just keep these in your head if you want. <clears throat> and keep in mind that the sermon title is Cheap Grace. The first question I want you to think of it is what is the most expensive thing you have ever bought? Now, I try to be somber, but I want to say my wife here. But anyway, sorry. No. <laughs> try not to joke on a night like this. But as you think about the most expensive thing that you have ever bought, is it something that's materialistic? Is it something that is sentimental? Or is it something a little bit of both? Maybe the family farm. I want to tell you a story of something that happened in my grandpa's, fun um, grandpa's estate. 
uh, at the auction. I remember the auction. I don't really remember this event, but uh, one of my cousins bought my grandpa's 30 odd six. Now, I never hunted with grandpa, so it didn't have any sentimental value to me. And at the time, I think I was only about Canaan's age. <clears throat> but Craig brings down grandpa's 30 odd six, and he uses it every year. And uh, I ask him about when he bought it. And he said, well, when that came up on the auction, he said, I put my head down and my card up. And I didn't bring my card down until they quit calling. He said, I knew I was going to buy it. He said, I had already planned. It did not matter what that gun was going for. I was buying that gun. Sentimental value. It had meaning to him. Now, as you think about something that you have bought that has meaning, that has value to you, I want to switch over to another question here, changing from left to right field. What is grace? Think about what is grace, and more specifically, the grace that Jesus Christ has to offer you and I. And follow me here as I take a couple questions bouncing all over as we talk about money and uh, materials and then sentimental things. Um, have you ever taken out a loan? Right now, if you still have a loan, if there was one loan that you had that could be resolved right now, just poof, wipe clean, probably be your biggest one, right? You know, we, uh, um, I make it very clear, I am not a self-made man. Uh, people have helped this out in tremendous ways. Um, <clears throat> when I was down at Bloomington, I've told this story a few times. Uh, I had given a sermon uh, when I was in the rotation, <clears throat> and a gentleman was up visiting from Chicago. He heard me preach twice, I think. And uh, his name was Paul, and he came up to me afterwards. We were having, I, I can remember the bars that we were eating, okay? That's how my mind works, food. And uh, we were having bars, and he got talking to me. He says, Lance, he says, I want to pay your student loans off. I don't remember ever talking to him about loans. I'd only met him twice, uh, but he knew at this time we only had Job and Canaan. We didn't even have just Job. So he knew that I wanted to get into ministry. He knew this. So uh, this man, and guys, I went to a private school. My student loans were not small. We had been paying them back. Um, but he, only meeting me twice, wrote out a check for $40,000. I make it very clear that I am not a self-made man. I, I have a lot of stuff that people have done for me. Um, now, his name was Paul. I don't even know his last name. I never even got to actually thank him. He went back to Chicago. He did this all through the church. Um, and I found out six months later he passed away. Never even got to go say thanks to his wife because by the time I found out that six months later after he did this that he had died, because I had no contact, I didn't even really know him, his wife died. So there was no family left. You know how great that feels to have that loan resolved? Just yesterday, uh, Emily and I sent the final payment to her student loans. Done. To have a loan gone is an amazing feeling. Now, as you keep that all in your mind as I talk about monetary, materialistic, sentimental stuff, and even loans, here we are on Good Friday. Now, over at Wazika today, we did uh, the crosswalk, which to me, honestly, because it's not something that I started, you know, I just stepped into, is almost, um, it feels a little awkward because... It wasn't my brainchild. It's a very cool thing that we do, um, but I didn't come up with it. So what we do is we meet down at the shelter, and we walk uh, along the street, and we walk along the highway. We cross the highway, and cars go by, and they see us carrying this cross. And today as I was doing that, I was thinking, I cannot imagine what it had to be for Jesus Christ to be stripped down. You know, when they hung him, he was in his underwear. They did it to humiliate him. I was walking up Main Street in Wazika and thinking about how many people saw me, you know, all 12. And Jesus walks through, um, I, I am quoting a number off the top of my head, 
I can't remember, it was a mile to three miles, I just can't remember, um, through the town to Golgotha, carrying a cross in his underwear, and everyone made sure that they made enough noise as they embarrassed him. I couldn't help but think about that humiliation part. You know, last night at Monday, Thursday, I spoke about humility. Jesus was humiliated. And the scene that always gets to my mind, see, tonight at our house, we will watch uh, The Passion. Um, some of the kids that are older watch it, some don't. And there's a scene in there where Christ falls down against his cross, and then he gets back up. He leans into it and kisses it as he embraces the cross. Why? Why, when Christ is being humiliated, punished, tortured, publicly displayed, and crucified in a cross, why does he embrace that cross? He does it to offer us grace. To pay a debt that we could never pay. Sin's cost is death, and it must be paid in full. You know, I say the word sin, and it depends. But honestly, guys, with a congregation like this, because you're here tonight, I know that you uh, have a faith, a pretty solid one. Um, but you say sin, uh, you think about even kids or people that just don't understand it. They laugh it off like it's just another word. But sin is a very powerful word. It is a very meaningful, nasty word. It's a heavy word because sin has such a cost. Now, grace is freely offered to us, but just like freedom here, nothing is free. Christ's grace is free to us, but he had to pay. You see, I think our churches, and especially here in the U.S., um, and I'm making a very generalized statement as, of course, there is exceptions to everything, um, but I think that an awful lot of our churches, an awful lot of Christians have a sense of cheap grace. And hear me out here. We think that grace is cheap. We think Jesus loves you. It's okay. I can live my life any way that I want. Everyone sins, and Jesus is going to love me anyway. So it's not a big deal if I sin. Sin is relative. How far from the truth can that be? And guys, I'm not tackling any one sin. You know, on the surface, what I said is true. It is correct. Yes, Jesus does love you. Even when you sin, he still does love you in the same way that you love your children when they screw up. It doesn't mean that he accepts it and he's okay with it. Let me ask you, what does God think about sin? Ever heard the story of Noah and the ark? Sodom and Gomorrah? God does not like sin. Sin is heavy, and sin has a cost. And our sin cost Jesus Christ his life. And it was not in an easy way. It was slow. It was painful. It was brutal. It was agony. You see, grace is not cheap. What it cost Christ is a bill that we could never foot. It's a bill that we could never, ever pay. Your sin had a heavy price tag. And with that being said, do not cheapen what God has already redeemed. If your life has sin in it, then you've got to address it. You know, I have made it very clear. I think the biggest sin in my life is anger, followed by a sailor's mouth. I am not proud of that. It is not something that I uh, encourage. In fact, I'm ashamed of what my kids see and what they learn. Sin is something we must address because it is our sin that got Jesus Christ whipped, beaten, and publicly humiliated and executed. God does love you the way you are, but if he loved you the way you were, he never would have had to send his son to the cross. He loves you how you are, but he loves you enough for you to change, to go away from that sin. Your debt would have never been paid 
if he just loved you the way you were. No sin should be taken lightly. Guys, I am very grateful for what Paul did for our family when he paid that bill. And that is something that is monetary. That $40,000, I would have earned it. I would have paid it off. But I cannot earn my salvation. I cannot pay my debt. I made a post some of you have seen on Facebook today over at the church in uh, Wazika. Ed had set up it. It was a really neat picture with the cross and the crown of thorns there. I said, you know, on Facebook, I said, too many people miss the meaning of today. Good Friday should be about as big as Easter. Maybe even bigger. God's most precious investment was you. You ever think about that? You think about the stuff that you have invested in, land, uh, a house, college education, a business, and you think how you pour your life into it. God's greatest investment was in you when he decided to do this. See, he knew that your soul was a battle and your soul was up on that auction block. So you know what God did? He got out his card. He put his head down and he held his card up. Jesus Christ, he held him on that cross and he held him there until Satan quit bidding for you and Jesus said, it is finished. Grace is not cheap. You have been redeemed and Christ bought you from Satan. Grace is expensive. And only a loving father with an obedient son aided by the power of the Holy Spirit could hold that card up and pay whatever the cost was. You see, your grace wasn't cheap. It was priceless. See, I have a problem with cheap grace and why I think in general, churches fail. Churches that preach cheap grace. Cheap grace never leads to change. And if Christ loved you the way you were, his son wouldn't have to die. He loves you while you were a sinner, but he loves you enough to see you change. Priceless grace recognizes that you were like that and now you are redeemed. Priceless grace recognizes that you are priceless to God, that God hated that sin in your life so much that he would do anything. So now as we leave tonight, you know, we'll go through the rest of the service. We'll have another song and a final prayer. And after that prayer, we just kind of head out of here in real somberness, quietly. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to let your life and your actions show that you have been bought with priceless grace, not cheap grace. So when you go from here, when you meet that sin, and guys, I say a sermon that is difficult for me because I admit that I really fail with my anger and my, the words that I say. We have to challenge ourselves to flee from that old life because Christ doesn't want that. He doesn't want my kids to hear the F-bombs left and right. So as we leave, as we prep for the celebration of Easter Sunday morning, let us live a life that shows priceless grace, not cheap grace. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we, uh, we say we thank you for what you've done, but thank you cannot truly explain our gratitude. Lord, when we realize uh, that you embraced the cross, when we look at the Father who held you up and outbid Satan, because nothing Nothing could stop your love for us. Lord, when we recognize how expensive your grace was, that free gift to us, but how much it cost you, Lord, let that be amplified in our life. 
let us show it. Lord, when we struggle with our sin, give us your grace, but break our hearts so that we try, so that we move to change. Lord, I pray for each person here and myself included that we will live a life that exemplifies priceless grace, not cheap grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join in me with this closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, graciously behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon a cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys, and we look forward to the Easter Sunday celebration.